Welcome to Schweitzer Drive, a podcast where we explore what goes on between the generation of electricity and the light switch. Join Dave Whitehead as he interviews the entrepreneurs, innovators, and experts who are inventing the future of electric power. Hello, I'm Dave Whitehead, CEO of Schweitzer Engineering Laboratories, and I'm here with Dr. Ed Schweitzer, founder, president, and chief technology officer at SEL. Today, we're going to be discussing the topic of free enterprise. Whether in engineering or business, Ed has always encouraged us to go back to first principles, and that's what we're going to begin with with this conversation. Welcome, Ed. Well, thank you, Dave. Government and economics are intertwined. What are some principles of government and business you believe that help better all peoples of society? Well, thanks. I like to go back to first principles. I worked for uh, uh, as a professor for a while, and uh, uh, Dr. Harriet Regas was my boss. And one day she was on a rampage about first principles, and she said, we need those guys in physics to teach our students F equals MA and you can't push on a rope. So it is good to go back to first principles and uh, so that we begin solving problems and approaching our, our lives and our careers on a solid foundation. So we do know historically that society seemed to flourish when markets are fair, free, flat, and open. And we're so lucky in our country that our founding fathers realized that we the people have these inalienable rights granted by our creator to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And from there, they wrote a constitution defining a federal government with limited and specific powers. And the examples of those were to a, a, a solid currency, uh, providing for the common defense and uh, assuring uh, uh, justice for everybody. So these are very, very fundamental things. Some other fundamental things are to realize that uh, uh, beyond that, in the eyes of our founding fathers, that uh, the rest of government is really left up to the, to the states. So that means that our, labor- our states, our 50 states, are 50 different laboratories that can try things, some of which will work and some won't. And we've sort of even, uh, we've realized this big time in this uh, unique experiment of responding to the COVID challenge. So we can expand that on our own a little bit uh, uh, to uh, more personal things about practicing unquestionable ethics. And uh, also realizing that free enterprise is America's innovation engine. And the U.S. Chamber of Commerce has in their, their logo, it says, the spirit of free enterprise. Uh, at the beginning, as you were talking about uh, uh, free enterprise, you, you talked about um, fair, flat, free, and open markets. Could you expand a little bit on that? Well, yes, I think uh, uh, we really look to our government to defend these, to make sure a market is fair. And I think we'll talk a little bit more as this unfolds uh, today. And a part of that is to realize that uh, transactions are efficient if you and I both uh, participate in, in a transaction and both of us are winning. So if I have a car I want to sell you and you need uh, transportation, then uh, we'll come to a deal that benefits you and benefits me. And in a, a free market, that happens with as little intervention, intervention from government or, or uh, other interests as possible. It, just a little... St- Side note, often in business you hear there's a, there's a winner and a loser to transaction. Do you have any thoughts on winners or losers or win-win or? Yes. Um, let's take a look at it like this. Let, let's suppose, Dave, that uh, uh, somebody's got a good idea. Maybe you got a good idea. 
and uh, you pursue it on your own, if it's a real good idea, you're going to invest your own money. And if the idea is not so good, you're going to try to attract others, other people's money. And if the idea is a real pig, you'll go see if you can get the government to pay for it. <laughs> Let's try to do our, our great ideas and just invest in ourselves. Uh, what does standing up to f for free enterprise mean to you? Well, I mentioned the U.S. Chamber, the spirit of free enterprise, and our U.S. Chamber oftentimes does a good job, usually does, in, in doing just that. But it also means that if, if I detect sophistry as a good citizen, I should uh, discourage it, and of course, I should not participate in it myself. That is, I should not use some kind of um, oh, flawed thinking to say, that, well, the world would just be a better place if there was a regulation requiring somebody to use my product. I think that's a kind of a thing that is uh, getting in the way of free enterprise. and. We talk a lot about how we like to com um, compete to serve and about how competition at first it makes you sick and then it makes, makes you better. And uh, another way of looking at it is uh, the moral justification of, product is the ri of uh, profit is the risk uh, that we undertake. What do you, what do you see the, the, the role then of... Uh an individual or an individual company or uh, public or private enterprise versus government in, when it comes to, to, to free enterprise and who sets the, the, the rules or the boundaries. Are we headed in the right direction? Is it becoming easier to do business? I know there's economic freedom books and, and things like that out there. And it, what, what, what are your senses on that? Are we headed in the right direction, certainly as, as uh, the U.S. and, and our, our economy? Well, there's been a tremendous... Uh increase in the regulations and a difficulty in uh, uh, practicing arts, starting a new business. And I think that um, people are starting to become more and more aware of that and don't like it. And it is um, contrary to what our founding fathers have in mind. It's contrary to our best interests as individuals. And the government role uh, really is to set up the least amount of interference or participation in markets as, as uh, necessary to ensure that you and I play nice with uh, each other and, uh, and other people. You, you mentioned that uh, probably the most efficient transaction that can occur is when it's just between two individuals, one that has something to offer and the other one is willing to pay the price for, for that. Could you talk a little bit about the, the concept of interested sophistry of merchants? Well, Adam Smith uh, wrote The Wealth of Nations in uh, 1775. And he said, it is always, it must be the interest of the great body of people to buy whatever they want of those who sell it cheapest. This proposition could never have been called into question had not the interested sophistry of merchants and manufacturers confounded the common sense of mankind. So that was hundreds of years ago already. And then we start to think about what's happening today. We could really say merchants, manufacturers, and government. We're actually uh, frequently looking to government to set policies. And these policies are often um, uh, driven by very, very good um, intentions. And oftentimes even the best of intentions are uh, uh, blown off track by uh, uh, special interests. And these are things that we really must, must um, avoid. And part of the problem here, we often see it when we look in a mirror. As you know, Dave, that uh, uh, SEL has never gone to Washington, D.C. or to Olympia or any other state capitals and said, the world would just be a little bit better place if the government would only do X, where X is something that would particularly favor SEL. Instead, 
when we do talk to our elected officials, we are asking for fair, free, flat, open, because we know that floats all boats, and uh, that's the very best way for us as individuals, a company, and a country to prosper. There is a book, and I forgot who the gentleman was that wrote it, but it's, it's economics in one simple lesson or in, in one lesson. Yes, uh, Mr. Hazlitt. And, exactly. And uh, one of the things that stuck with me reading, reading through that, though, is a, a, a lot of short-term thinking propagates into laws. It would just oh so better, right? And it probably it helps one, one group very quickly for perhaps a short time. Um, and his one of one of the, the the themes throughout the book was how do we when we're making economic policy or changing economic policy we need to have a much longer view and and, and what are your your thoughts on that are we too short sighted not long sighted or not looking at the big picture enough or you know it's hard to regulate what you don't understand and it's very hard to imagine regulations written that apply to something that hasn't been invented yet. And a a recent example of this is the Internet, that uh, the Internet came to be and there's no regulations. There there was few, still are generally few regulations around it, and uh, a lot of people see that as as pretty good. But... uh, you can also see that there's a lot of interest in, in uh, saying, well, the Internet will just be that much better if it's somehow regulated or controlled. So I think that's a good example. Another one is, uh, say, uh, airplanes or the electric power industry. You know, as these different uh, industries emerged, uh, the regulations had to... Had to uh, um, um, so there is some need or at least a perceived need to come up with regulations appropriate to it. Unfortunately, many times those are driven by, by sophistry, I'm afraid. Talk to us about misleadingly simple. Simple insights explained by Milton Friedman in Free to Choose in, in the book in 1980. Well, Milton Friedman was uh, also very fond of uh, Adam Smith. And uh, he said the key insight of Adam Smith's wealth of nations is misleadingly simple. If an exchange between two parties is voluntary, it will not take place unless both parties believe they will benefit from it. And on the other side of the coin, he said, most economic fallacies derive from the neglect of this simple insight from the tendency to assume that there is a fixed pie that one party can gain only at the expense of another. Now, there's many people who will fall for that economic fallacy thinking that my business can only get ahead at the expense of your business. And what this neglects is the creativity and the invisible hand of economic freedom. Um, You've had the phrase that the pie is not fixed, and you were talking a little bit about that. Could you expand a little bit about that in, in, in your philosophy on that? Sure. Think, think about um, going in a grocery store and going down the aisle where the detergents are. So I've never taken a marketing class, but I heard that in a marketing class, one of the things they talk about sometimes is shelf space. And that uh, if your brand is really good, you'll have more shelf space, and that's better for your business. But it's all soap. So if you're fighting over 100 feet of shelf space to see if you get 50 feet of it and everybody else gets 50, you might say you're doing pretty good. But now let's suppose that instead of fighting over the space on a shelf, that you go invent something new that nobody... uh, that hadn't occurred to anybody else. So if you invent something new that hadn't occurred to anybody else, then you're growing the pie. It's like putting up more shelves. I I love that. And I I always make the joke about the pie is we can always grow the pie because we'll come up with something different. And then if we're really, really clever, we'll we'll invent cake. Nobody was even thinking about cake. This is a 
I think yeah. what's, what's truly remarkable about... Uh, We're always talking about pie when we go through this story. Who forgot about cake? Yeah, that's right. We love cake. Um, Milton Friedman in Capitalism and Freedom talked about economic freedom and political freedom. How does this apply to us today? Well, what he said is economic arrangements play a dual role in the promotion of a free society. Freedom and economic arrangements is an end to itself. He went on to say, in the second place, economic freedom is also an indispensable means towards the achievement of political freedom. So the big deal here is that they, you cannot separate the two. It's not like oil and water that are immiscible, that economic and political freedom go hand in hand. You cannot have one without the other. That's how very, very important this is. It, it, I, I bet you have thought much about this, but we, we do talk about that, that the economics and, and political systems are really tied hand in hand. And we've seen America is certainly one experiment that's happened. There's a bunch of other experiments, whether it's over in Europe. And I, I look at uh, Venezuela right now as an experiment that uh, probably is going places people um, would rather not have it go. What, what, are, what are your thoughts on is, is capitalism the right way to get socialism? Is there a perfect one, or will we find our, find our way? Well, when it comes to these isms, there are systems like socialism that are uh, man-made constructs. And I think uh, what we commonly refer to as capitalism shouldn't even be an ism because it's nothing that uh, humankind actually uh, invented. It's a very natural tendency that, hey, if I have something, Dave, and you uh, you need it and you have something that I need it, we'll come to some kind of an arrangement that is uh, mutually beneficial. And that very basic transaction, whether it's between you and me and me and somebody else and you and somebody else, that every time these transactions take place, it's a very natural and human uh, thing that doesn't require any other humans to be, to be writing down a set of rules. Um, we're not designing a board game like Monopoly or something, which would make it a, maybe it's monopolism, there's one for that. And that in, instead, this is such a very, very natural thing. That's great. You've discussed that free enterprise is the fertile soil of creativity. Could you talk about this in a little more depth? You know, Dave, you know, the, if somebody has an idea and they want to pursue their dream and that if that idea falls on the fertile soil, if it's easy for that individual to pursue his or her dream, his or her arts, then that is going to be good for us all. And conversely, if we start playing favorites, say in government by regulation or taxes, or then uh, we start interfering with that and actually salting the fertile soil. And there's so many ways that humankind has found to uh, to do that, unfortunately, such as subsidies and mandates and tariffs and quotas and licenses, permits and regulations, all these things generally get in the way. And that's why it's so important for us to defend fair, free, flat, and open markets. I do believe that the more we focus on free enterprise and bring ourselves back to these basics, the inalienable rights, the life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, the better off we're all going to be. Thank you, Ed. That was, uh, well, a great conversation. Thanks for taking some time to, to talk about free enterprise. Certainly important to, to all we do in our, our, our country and, and around the world. Um, thank you. Well, it's very near and dear to my heart because, as you know, how much we love inventing our future. Thanks. Thanks, Dave. Thank you for stopping by Schweitzer Drive. Join us again as we learn about, explore, and celebrate electric power. For more information about the show, please visit selinc.com slash Schweitzer Drive. <laughs>